My name is Ashwin Venkatesh and I'm the Educational Lead for NANSIG. Um, welcome to the second instalment of NANSIG's new webinar series, Neurosurgical Career Insights, where we hope to provide medical students and junior doctors with an overview of what a career in neurosurgery entails. Um, last time we covered an introductory talk on what is neurosurgery, um, which you can find on our YouTube channel. And today we intend to explore in more depth the principles of neurosurgery. So, um, to that end, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Sanjeeva J. Ratna, who is a consultant neurosurgeon at Oxford University Hospitals, where he serves as the lead for the skull based surgery program um, and he teaches clinical neuroanatomy at the university. His clinical expertise lies in complex skull based lesions with open and minimally invasive techniques and also facial pain syndromes. And his research explores brain tumor biology and the application of AI, robotics, and digital health in skull based surgery. We're very grateful uh, to Mr. Jay Ratner for offering to speak to us today. Uh, so that's it from me. Um, thank you everyone for joining and uh, over to you, Mr. Jay Ratner. Thank you very much. Ashwin, so thank you, thank you very much for this uh, very kind invitation. Uh, it's a real pleasure to talk about uh, neurosurgery to an audience that I'm that are giving up the evening to hear from me. So I'm, uh, it's a real privilege and thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, as you said, I, I head up the skull base surgery program uh, at Oxford, and I was the previous training program director. Now, this is a very broad topic, so obviously I've had to focus it down a little bit, and I picked a sort of part of neurosurgery, which I hope will give you a flavor, uh, and it's an area that's of great interest to me at present. So just a little bit more about myself. I, um, I trained in Bristol, and I spent some time abroad. I did my research uh, in Boston, and as you as you alluded to in your introduction, uh, my practice is very much on complex brain tumors, uh, pain syndrome, things like that. And uh, I take it the audience probably doesn't have a huge uh, experience of skull base surgery and things like that. So I'll just talk you through uh, what some of these pictures are showing. So I think here it's pretty obvious. This is a coronal slice on an MRI scan, and in the dominant left hemisphere there is a very very large tumor deep within the brain, so there are issues about access. Deep within the brain, there's issues about the eloquence of the brain around it, speech areas, motor areas, things like that. Uh, and then I have been involved in cases like this. So the sort of white areas here are all a bone tumor. It's invaded into the cavernous sinus bilaterally, so you'll remember all the cranial nerves going through the cavernous sinus. These black dots are the internal carotid artery. This is the brain stem. This black dot is the basal artery. What you cannot see are the tiny perforators that supply the brain stem that will all be involved in this tumor. Uh, we're looking to try and excise these things fully. Similarly here, it's another similar sort of, uh, it's what's called an epidermoid. It's a skin that is, in the time of birth, has been growing in the wrong place deep within the brain. And these are the vessels of the circle of Willis, where the tiny perforators all involved in the tumor. And finally here, uh, is a case, uh, the, this, you can sort of see the outline of the, of the skull and scalp there and an axial MRI slice here. In orange is a tumor, in red is a large cyst within the brainstem that we have to remove. Um, this green area here is this trigeminal tract within the brainstem. These are the motor pathways of the brain, including within the brainstem. Uh, and, and so to summarize, really, th these are some of the most challenging cases you'll face in neurosurgery. Uh, and there are a number of principles that are involved in getting to this point where we can remove them and more importantly, remove them safely. Of course, anybody can remove these things, but the patient has to be well or better following the operation. And that's really the focus of what I want to talk about today. So... Where do you start with something like this? And I've alluded to where, where I'm heading, but just to give you an overview again, I know you've probably had this before. Neurosurgery is very broad, and I'm sure um, possibly by the time you're consultants, uh, should you continue down this path and become neurosurgeons, um, things would change dramatically. So when I trained, you know, we would train in all of these areas. So on the right here is an extra dural. Uh, that's something I'm sure everybody will have to do uh, even 10, 15 years from now, even as we become more subspecialized. But obviously, this is a critical emergency. It's life-threatening. It is time-sensitive. You have to do it within 
uh, within an hour or two or, or less. Uh, and it's an operation that makes a huge difference to patients. You, know, you, you literally are saving people's lives. So we have everything from the immediately life-threatening to some of the stuff I've just shown you. This is sort of here to suggest the complex anatomy of skull vase surgery that takes days or weeks of planning and suddenly a good 10, 14 hours to operate on, all the way to the very clever work done by functional neurosurgeons uh, who are probably going to lead when the time comes for neural interfacing, but at the moment it's movement disorders, pain syndromes, things like that. Spine surgery, the bread and butter for a lot of us while we're training, we're now becoming much more subspecialized. Uh, it's obviously hugely important in terms of returning a common problem, very important in returning people back to their daily lives. And finally, intrinsic tumor surgery in what can be highly eloquent areas, including awake surgery and things like that. And this represents the motor cortex for uh, intrinsic brain tumors. So it's difficult where you start. You know, you've got the very complex selective stuff that I do. If, uh, you've got the acute emergency stuff we all do. Uh, and trying to, trying to come up with principles for all of this, I think, is difficult. And, and that's not what I'm going to do today. I think I'm going to focus on a very specific bit in what is this very broad topic of principles of neurosurgery. And of course, we, we cannot in any way underestimate the organ that we are working on. As I've described here, this very fragile but delicate organ that is, it makes us who we are, you know, everything that we are, our hopes, our dreams, our aspirations, our worries, our fears, everything. Uh, and these are pictures of what the, of course, what the human brain looks like, the blood vessels and things injected. Uh, here it shows the deep connections between the brain that now we're able to map out uh, intraoperatively and preoperatively when planning operations. And then the very complex nature of the blood vessels and the perforators that go on to supply, this is a picture of the brain stem, with the cranial nerves, seventh and eighth cranial nerves here, and it's interesting blood supply. So this is a very complex organ, it's of huge importance. Um, it doesn't regenerate, unlike the liver and things like that. So it is an area that uh, I think requires significant technical skill, I think all areas of surgery do, but there's no question that neurosurgery certainly demands a very, very high level of technical skill, and I'd like to talk quite a bit about that today. The other thing to remember, of course, while we talk about this, that um, my life as a medical student, as a junior doctor, uh, was very, very different to yours. Uh, all of these things that I show in this picture here uh, didn't exist. Uh, this is supposed to represent the uh, use of AI nowadays in our, in our imaging. That's an area that I'm very interested in that I'm working on. Uh, iPhones didn't exist. Big data definitely didn't exist. Self-driving cars, robotic surgery. None of these things existed. And so the world, when you become, or when you're at my stage, um, will be very, very different. And I think that's one of the principles about evolving with time. Uh, and I like to put a picture of an elevator or a tall building uh, whenever I talk about change, uh, because when I talk about robotic surgery or self-driving cars and things like that, I like to remind people that a uh, hundred years ago, people thought it was completely mad to get into a steel box and let a computer essentially drive you up very high floors. They would refuse to get into elevators or lifts um, unless there was a human driving that process. Uh, and of course now not, nobody thinks anything of it to getting in there and, and going up very, very tall buildings. Um, and so things change. Uh, we have to move with the change and, and that's one of my points I'll come on to later. But I think you have to understand that uh, whatever you do in the coming years or decades, things will be, I'm sure, very different to how it is now. Uh, and I certainly had no idea that any of these things on uh, the slide here were going to happen. Okay, so principles of surgery, it's a really big topic, uh, and I can't cover all of it in an hour. But I think there are some areas that I'm particularly interested in at the moment, and that's, uh, and that's what uh, this little bit is about. So I, uh, obviously I, I do these sort of very difficult operations, but I'm also very interested in training uh, the next generation of surgeons. Uh, I don't believe uh, in what some surgeons believe that they can be the only person who can do certain operations and things like that, even for very complex operations. I think everybody can. Uh, it's about putting in a lot of hard work, but also you need to have the right people to train you. And I'm in the process uh, developing a systematic framework uh, for everybody who comes onto my team, from the very senior fellows I get from all over the world on my fellowship to the most junior people uh, on the, sometimes F2s on our team. 
And that's really where I'm at at the moment uh, and what I'm interested in. And, and so a lot of this talk in terms of some of the principles in neurosurgery I'm going to talk about are going to be involving technical excellence. But you can't really discuss surgery or anything like that without first having a patient-centered approach. And, that, and that's key. And, and I think, you know, partly due to recent uh, cases in law, uh, but also I think our evolving understanding and, and, and where we are you know, as, a, as a society, we've really moved away from this sort of paternalistic approach uh, and where the patient's involvement in decision making is, is understood to be important and is paramount. And so in anything we discuss, I think we first have to say the first principle is always going to be, it has to be patient-centered care. I'll just talk a little bit about that. I think whatever you do, wherever you're going, uh, and, and certainly I've got this massive thing I'm doing here, uh, I think you have to have a systematic approach. I'll, maybe, I'll give a little bit of an example of that, what I'm doing in terms of how I'm teaching complex operations to people, even just you know, general neurosurgery. And, and really all of this other things, striving for excellence, well, of course doing no harm, the importance of anatomy in any, for any surgical specialty, and all of these other things here uh, are all about being the best possible surgeon or the best possible neurosurgeon you can be for your patients. And I'm going to use what is one of the most complex bits of neurosurgery, which is skull base surgery, uh, to highlight some of that. So that's what we're going to do today. As I said, this is paramount in any discussion we have, um, whether it's about principles, about anything. And we've we've moved away from telling people what to do. And I think that's definitely the right thing. That's really been my practice uh, all along. And it's really important that you, you take a good history, but also you really find out uh, about their values, what's important to them, what sort of deficits they have, they may have from, from approaches you choose. And you have to then decide, do you, should you really be doing an operation? Is an operation the right thing? Is it gonna help them? Uh, there are other options, conservative care, uh, radiotherapy. And I think actually in the UK, we're very good uh, and not operating, which actually is a very, very hard thing to do. And you'll find in lots of other healthcare systems, they are very bad at doing that and sometimes can harm people. But that's something we do very well here. And it is not easy to do. It is actually always, sometimes always easier to offer someone something. But that is not always the right thing. Now, I say the patient's choice are paramount, but really, you know, we are the experts. So we must advise, we must guide, we must listen to what they say and come to a decision together. And then what I'm going to talk a lot about is, you know, what I think are, are the key points at whatever stage you're at, uh, at getting a lot better at any skill, in this case, neurosurgery. And this is the sort of thing you'll be, you'll be faced with. So this is, I just cut and paste uh, our electronic referral system and, uh, you know, the sort of clocking. And, and, and there's a lot to take in, you know, you have to understand sometimes when you're talking to people, they're not, you know, you may not be talking to them in their first language. Uh, and, and talking through interpreters isn't, or even family members is definitely not the same. There's a lot going on uh, with their symptoms. Uh, I quite like using this history actually when I talk about being systematic and, and, and working through things. Uh, but essentially, if you, if you go through this systematically, you can, you can sort of pinpoint where the, the location of the problem is. And it's in the, what's called the cerebellopontine angle. And then you can start to tailor what you're going to do and, and where you're going to go forward with this. And then you've got to work out, you know, how bad are things for them. Um, this, this, this may be something we think is very minor. This patient, this is the patient's hearing tests and, and their patient's scans. Uh, and actually this patient has a profound hearing loss. Um, the decibels are on the left, frequencies on the top here, consonants are sort of in this range here. So this patient's going to have great difficulty hearing speech on the right hand side uh, because of this, this large tumor. And you've got to start to consider all of these things because um, actually in this operation, and this patient definitely needs an operation, and we have to guide them or advise anyway in that direction because of the severe compression on the brain stem. This area here is the brain stem. There's a large cysts in this tumor. This part of the brain stem should be over here. So there's significant pressure uh, on this patient's brain, so they need an operation. But actually, I said at the beginning, you know, they should come out as well as they went in or better, but this patient is gonna come out with actually no hearing on their right-hand side. And, and, and you may feel that's a small price to pay at the end of the day for, you know, essentially 
preventing them from ultimately dying and reversing a lot of the other neurological deficits. But these are sort of things that we have to talk through clearly with patients. And we don't know, you know, is this person a pianist, whatever, how important is or some sort of job that requires just um, hearing in both ears. Uh, these are all things that have to be discussed. So we've very clearly and quite rightly we've moved towards this sort of patient-centered approach. And that's important. So it's not just about being very technically skilled and you can do operations well, but you have to explain things clearly, what you're going to achieve, what you're definitely not going to achieve, and what sort of harm you may cause for a greater benefit. So that's an important thing to consider. The next thing to consider before you jump into operations is what they need and what they want. So these are two separate patients here. These three pictures here on the left are a young lady who unfortunately is in a very difficult situation. She's got terrible headaches. Uh, and during her scans, she was again thought to have the same tumor I showed earlier, this vestibular schwannoma. Uh, so sort of most of the patients I'm going to show today, just to keep it consistent, will have that. Uh, she has this, this tumor here on the left hand side, again, gentle pressure on the brainstem. Now she has crushing headaches uh, and she starts to get uh, blurring of vision. And actually, if you, if you start to take a very careful history and examine her carefully and go through things, you start to realize that actually the vestibular schwannoma is not her problem. It's not causing a buildup of brain fluid or anything like that. And she has a separate condition and that's what these two pictures here are supposed to show. They're supposed to show this is the foramen magnum here, from the sagittal slice MRI scan and the cerebellar tonsils are herniating downwards almost below the level of the first cervical vertebra here. You see crowding of the frame magnum. So actually she has benign intracranial hypertension. And if you were to launch into an operation in her, you would find yourself in a world of trouble. You're not going to make her headaches better. What you're gonna find is you're gonna go into an extremely tight brain in a young patient. You'll have great difficulty dealing with that. There are some approaches you choose to mitigate that if you really have to. But actually be a very challenging operation for almost, well, actually no gain because this is not, the vestibular schwannoma is not causing her problems. So you have to understand that is not the case. You also have to understand if you had to go into her, that actually be very challenging and how you would mitigate that. And that you can tell uh, from certain factors on these scans. You then contrast that with this. This is a very, this is a much older patient in the 60s, also with the left side of vestibular schwannoma that is growing. It was a lot smaller than this a few years ago and it's, it's continuing to grow. He has very favorable anatomy for surgery. He's got large fluid spaces, a relatively relaxed brain. You'd have very good access corridors in with a lot less early work uh, to get straight onto the tumor. And we can do a very good resection for him. And that is what we offer him. But we also offer him the other major alter alternative, and that is radiosurgery or radiotherapy to treat this. And then it comes to you know what the patient's values, beliefs, uh, you know, what they've been through and, and what they expect and expectations and all of that. Uh, and this is a patient who was actually quite averse to us having any surgery. Uh, and, and, and you see this, you see patients who are very keen on surgery, you see patients who are very averse to surgery, and it's important, it's important to explain the, the risks and benefits in each situation very carefully. Uh, and it can be quite nuanced and you should really take your time and go through this. Uh, now, I felt strongly actually surgery was a very good option for him, but at the end of the day, as I said, it is the patient's choice. You, you give the risks and benefits and the facts, and actually radiosurgery is not a bad option. Uh, and he went on uh, to have radiosurgery for that tumor. So you don't have to operate on everything. You definitely shouldn't operate on some things. But when you do come to operate, you have to be able to do it well. And, and that is the summary of all of that. And it's important to have a good understanding of your specialty so you can advise patients appropriately and listen to what they want. Let's talk about cases where we're moving on now where you really have to operate uh, and what that really entails and, and, and what are the sort of principles around that. So again, I said we're gonna keep talking about this tumor, which is a tumor that comes from the eighth cranial nerve. This is a flat axial slice through an MRI scan. On the opposite side, you get a glimpse of the cranial nerve. This is the seventh cranial nerve, that's the eighth cranial nerve. The eighth cranial nerve has gone on to form this huge absolutely huge tumor with significant distortion of the brain stem. The brain stem should be over there, like on the side. He's got quite a lot of symptoms that are getting worse. He actually comes in confused. You can imagine if 
if the eighth cranial nerve has formed this large tumor, that the seventh cranial nerve is now also going to be stretched all the way around it, spread out thinner than cling film. And having a facial nerve palsy, you may have seen patients where that is very disfiguring. It's like having a stroke. For anybody, including someone who runs their own business, nobody wants a facial nerve palsy. And, and the key to good surgery is really being able to remove the vast majority or all of this tumor while keeping the patients well, as I said. I'll talk about the anatomy again a bit later as well, but um, these are difficult areas to get to. And these are some just very, very beautiful pictures from the Roton collection. He was a very famous neurosurgeon who did a lot of good work uh, in neuroanatomy. I, I still read his work all the time. I learn something new every time, and, and the entire collection is free to access uh, on the internet if you're, if you're interested. But this is the sort of area we're talking about. We're talking about the cerebellopontine angle. So it's the area just behind your, uh, your ear in the posterior fossa. And it's a difficult area even to do a craniotomy. Oh, not, not difficult, but it's a challenging area even to just do a craniotomy. And, and you know, it's one of the first skills we'd start to teach our middle grade or middle level registrars as craniotomies going on to venous sinuses. So this is the sigmoid sinus. This is the transverse sinus. You can either come on this side or on this side of the sinus, but you have to really handle this large pool of venous blood. And something you learn as surgeons, veins are actually a lot harder to deal with than arteries. They're thin wall, they don't take stitches and things as well. They can be uh, a lot harder to manage uh, than arteries. The other thing to remember about large veins like this, straining back to the heart, that even if you make a small hole, then you get an air embolus, uh, which can be fatal. So just from removing the bone off on your way in, and you haven't even got onto the brain yet, you can potentially kill patients. Uh, and so you can start to imagine the level of skill and focus that's required in any sort of operations in this area. You're then gonna work on or work in between some very important cranial nerves. So once you get in, you can start to see there are the uh, cranial nerves uh, in that space of cerebral pontine angle. So this is seventh and eighth cranial nerve, the fifth, the trigeminal nerve here. You've got nine, 10, 11, obviously all the critical uh, functions. You know, even the most minor of injury here could leave someone needing a tracheostomy or a peg uh, in the long term. You then have, this is now a view of the front of the brain stem. Here's the pons here, the medulla is here. This is the cerebellar pontine angle area we're talking about, you can see the cranial nerves. And you can see you have the major blood vessels you're, you know, you're aware of, the vertebral basal artery, uh, I, uh, entering inferior cerebellar artery. But then you have these tiny, tiny, tiny perforators, and even the most minor of injury to perforators, particularly here around the medulla, uh, you can leave someone paralyzed bilaterally from the neck down. Uh, as the motor pathways run, uh, down, down front in the brainstem. Um, one other point to getting there is uh, you can have the, the carotid artery and the facial nerve within the rock solid bone. I said you can come behind or in front. And coming in front, you've got to drill through facial nerve, carotid artery, all that. So I put down here, should we be going there? Well, obviously the answer is, is yes. Uh, and then I go here, you know, once or twice a week. And can you really fix it? And it always strikes me that, you know, when I give these talks and things like that, that you have to be slightly crazy to think you should go into this area and that you can definitely fix anything you find while you're there, which is usually a very large vascular tumor that's hosing at you while you're trying to protect this very fine little nerve rootlets, the brain stem, these tiny perforators. So it's something that's not to be underestimated. How do you get to a point uh, where you can do things like this? And that's my point. I think everybody can do this. Um, anybody who wants to do it can definitely do this. Uh, I think it's, and I'll say it towards the end, I think it's a very rewarding thing to do. So I said on one, on one, on one of the principles of having a very systematic approach, and I've actually gone much further than this and how I'm teaching this now. Uh, but this is how I start in terms of breaking down um, how you go about doing an operation like this. Uh, and one of my trainees, when I said I was giving this talk about principles of operating and things, uh, said to me, you must say every step matters because I'm absolutely obsessed with saying that to them. Uh, and it's true, you know, there are some parts of the operation which are beautiful to watch, watch a video, things like arachnoidal dissection, you know, dissecting things off cranial nerves and the tumor and things like that. They're very beautiful to watch and technically very nice to do. But you have absolutely no chance of doing any of those things well 
uh, if you don't do all of these other things well. So you may think positioning is very boring. It's not important to just lie on an operating table. Actually, if you don't do this right, you have no chance of doing any of the other things. So I list this not uh, at your stage, uh, you're not going to be doing vestibular short normal operations or anything like that, or any major skull based stuff, but I think you should have an understanding that every single step matters. And if you want to get to the point where you want to successfully decompress the brainstem and cranial nerves, everything matters. And you have to work systematically through each step. There will be, of course, sort of strands or branches coming off each thing, which are important to learn and, and, and become technically accomplished as you go along the way. Uh, but it's about A, having a systematic framework and then sort of breaking it down and going further and further into it and understanding that every little bit matters. Okay, so maybe it's time just to, to see what I'm talking about uh, with, with, with a little a brief video. So this is a video um, of the operation of the patient scans you have just seen. The gentleman is 50 with a very large tumor. We have, we have done a crane up just to orientate you. We're on the right hand side. This is the top at the moment, it'll change. This is the going down towards the right, his right here is here. We have done a nice craniotomy right to the edges of those venous sinuses I talked about. And we're now going to do the first step uh, where we start to relax the brain down. Uh, as I said, you know, the brain is very full, it's pushing up uh, against the dura. And what we're going to find is that we need to get into the fluid spaces of the brain. You can't go in and do very careful surgery in a brain that's pushing against you. Uh, like this. I'm just going to skip forward a little bit uh, just to show you some of that. I'll skip forward a bit more. Okay, so you can see there's little bits of fluid that are coming. That's the brain fluid. We're slowly trying to access system. Sternum magma is difficult to access. We're going to start ac accessing around here. But what we want to do is take our time. Uh, this video is quite technical as well, slightly different audience. Uh, but it just shows how it worked around. And now, if you can tell, it's very different how it was at the start of this operation. Now the brain's very sunk in. Not very sunk in, it's sunken in more than it was. It's pulsing very nicely. It's a much more relaxed brain. And so now we can start to work around this brain and working into the deep structures of the brain stem. So it's not about rushing into what we may consider to be a more important part. So I'm just hitching all the, the bits and now we're going to get, so we're going to start working inside. Okay, so I've skipped forward. Uh, we're now working inside the tumor. We're starting to take tumor volume down, and now we're starting to work outside the tumor. This is the tentorium here. These are major blood vessels. And the only reason we're able to start to peel away in nice, and beautiful right now planes now. Now we're starting to peel the brain away from the tumor, beautiful right now planes as we position the patient well. We drain down uh, brain fluid. Taking out the inside of the tumor, we're going to employ a full range of techniques. If things are very stuck, we switch here with blunt dissection. Now we're going to sharp dissection. I won't worry too much about these principles. Uh, but it, the point is that there are there are levels in understanding, you know, what's happening in an operation, uh, and you have to systematically build up your skill level to get to the point, you know, where you can do something like this. I'm going to skip forward. Here you can see the ninth cranial nerves that I talked about. Uh, and you, know, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't rush in and, and, and do this step of the operation until all of the other steps were done first. Now in a nice relaxed environment, you can really employ uh, skills we've built successively or from more minor operations all the way to here. So you can see very sharp dissection, taking the ninth and tenth cranial nerves off this tumor. You want this patient to swallow, voice, all these things to be completely intact uh, at the end of this operation. And, and that is, you know, it is important. We don't want uh, you don't want a case where you've removed the tumor successfully, the patient is, um, is in any way less well. Okay, so at any point if we think that we're not making satisfactory progress, we take the volume down again and then we repeat the process. So this is now onto the brain stem. You can see some such to work as some of the perforators here on the brain stem. And we're working the eighth cranial nerve off this tumor, working the tumor off the brain stem. Lovely view of the brain stem here. You can see the eighth cranial nerve going into the tumor, the seventh cranial nerve, and things are further beyond there. Uh, and it's about gently working in ragnarok planes to take this forward. 
we must skip towards the end between some modern land. And we want to get to a point, we're just taking the last fragments of this tumor off. Major intracranial vessels with perforators coming off them, all of which are protected. Uh, we're switching between sharp and blunt dissection technique as appropriate. Okay, and then we leave a small residual. So you can see that all of this was tumor at the start, it's all gone. This is a very small, very, very thin residual that's left on the seventh cranial nerves. I said you would stretch out like cling film at uh, this point here and to protect it, we leave a small amount of tumor. Okay, so you go from a very large tumor to just a tiny amount left behind, very large tumor to just a tiny amount left behind. So how do you get to a point where you can do something like that? And that is what the next couple of slides are going to be about. It's about getting a systematic approach of constant, and it doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be for skull base surgery, you may be working on something very different uh, at the moment now. Um, you may be just learning to suture, you maybe you're a bit further along in learning craniotomies, things like that. But the really important thing to matter is that hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. I love that phrase, things from a basketball coach uh, in America. And this is just showing uh, another, another challenging case, this time along the optic nerves. But the, the, point is, the point is exactly the same. Uh, I'm just going to skip forward so you can see, uh, see what we're doing here. Just show you where the optic nerve was. So this is when you first start in. Uh, this is a, a right-sided approach. Uh, and you can see this is the optic nerve. This is the carotid arching on the right-hand side. This is the front, sorry, temporal lobe, frontal lobe here. Uh, and it's plastered along the edge here, and we have to slowly work, work around, work around, get the tumor down, and start to dissect this tumor off the optic nerves. And in Oxford, we do, we would always fenestrate the canals, not always done. Sometimes the tumors can be extremely adherent, you have to leave a tiny bit behind. The optic nerve is here, we're at high magnification, uh, and removing tumors off very, very delicate structures safely. And we find these patients' visions are better. Uh, postoperatively than they are preoperatively. I think I'll uh, skip forward to give you what the view is like uh, at the end of these long operations. So you see this tiny bit of tumor. We had a huge tumor before. Uh, this is the opposite optic nerve. This is the ipsilateral optic nerve. It's a carotid artery coming out. It's going to come over as the A1 segment. The um, middle cerebral artery will come here. So the point here is, you know, Neurosurgery uh, has, and I think a lot of, as I said before, a lot of surgery does, but particularly, definitely in neurosurgery, uh, there, is the, there is the real opportunity to pursue uh, an area of real technical excellence. And I think that's one of the things I really enjoy about neurosurgery, what really drew me to neurosurgery, uh, what I enjoy particularly about skull base surgery. These sort of operations are something that even as a consultant, you continue to get better. There are areas that you can work on. Uh, and you can spend your life getting better at this. Uh, and that's certainly what drew me to the subspecialty uh, of sub skull base surgery. I felt it was challenging. Uh, you can make a real technical skill, makes a real difference to patients doing these sort of operations well. Just dramatic things, this patient's vision, uh, patient's vision will be returned to them. Uh, you know, in the other patient's case, they get their life back, the risk to their life is gone. So this is an area that can, you, you, your hard work, your systematic persistence can really make a big difference uh, in people's lives. And that brings me on to this concept uh, uh, of what I think you know, everybody needs to do. I know, it's, I know I'm talking specifically to neurosurgery, but this concept of Kaizen, uh, this Japanese concept of productivity, where they feel you have to have, a, of course, any excuse to show a little clip from The Last Samurai. Um, this concept of Kaizen, where you need to have a systematic approach of constant reflection and feedback and be very, have a clear method for how you're going to get better every day. So what small improvements every day that take you from, you know, just learning to suit you all the way uh, to what I showed there. And this is the sort of framework, very basic framework that I have uh, when I'm working with any of the trainees. And actually, I use it myself. Uh, when I was a trainee neurosurgeon, I, I, I read all of these books and I absolutely loved them. Uh, I never considered myself someone uh, who picked up things quickly. I think it's, uh, for me, I've always had to, to work on it and then take my time to get better on things. 
Uh, and that's why when I hear consultants or anybody talk about some trainees that they feel doesn't innately have the skill for surgery, I think that's a complete and utter nonsense, actually. I think everybody can do it. Uh, I think you just have to want to do it. And then you want to follow a sort of cycle like this, you know, where you have a focused goal. You're then going to work on practice that technique. You're going to reflect on how that went, what you can do better. You're going to make that adjustment. And then the cycle continues. And having this clear plan and constantly reevaluating is, is key. Uh, and I put down it get better faster because actually, you know, within the constraints of the EWTD and things like that, I find I have a lot less time uh, to work with people on these things. Uh, and, and actually, you, what you want is to be able to maximize the time you have or the time they have. And that's what all of these books, and I'm sure there are more since, you know, out since then, uh, talk about that actually the people who do really well aren't necessarily the most talented, but they are the ones uh, who've been working on it consistently for a very long time. This concept of the 10,000 hours and things like that. Uh, comes out of a lot of the work done and uh, discussed here. And then I, I put down, you, what you, may, uh, you may or may not have noticed in the original slide, I, I put down, you have to get in the pool. Uh, and I think surgery is just like swimming. So you can listen to webinars like this, you can watch a lot of videos, uh, but you wouldn't expect to be able to swim unless you spent a lot of time in the pool. And surgery is exactly the same. So you have to do it a lot to get good at it. And you'll find that, you know, it starts off, it's all fine, you're in the pool, but at some point you're gonna be in open, difficult, choppy water. And unless you've spent a lot of time in the water, you're just not gonna be a good swimmer and it's exactly the same with surgery. So I think that's a key principle and I would, and I understand work-life balance is important. I understand uh, that there has to be, um, uh, uh, activities outside of work. I understand there are restrictions on the working time, but my advice would be to spend as much time as possible watching and definitely doing operations. I think that is absolutely key and an absolute core principle of trying to get better in neurosurgery or in fact any, any field of surgery uh, you may be currently in or, or, or may decide in the future. And then my analogy for being in the water uh, extends further, which I'll come back on to that. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about anatomy now, and, and I absolutely love uh, this phrase from Roton. I, I spoke about Roton earlier. I showed you some of his pictures, uh, and he always would say, the more you know, the more you see, and that's very true, and if you think about this picture here, depending on your level, you may see very little or a lot, but I'll just, I'll just talk you through it. So this is, a, this is an operation in, in the right cerebellopontine angle, and this is the trigeminal nerve. These are the seventh and eighth cranial nerves. And this bulge here is a spare cerebellar artery digging into the trigeminal nerve just where it enters the brain stem. And this causes a crippling condition called trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, and it's called a suicide disease because essentially in this disease, your brain misinterprets signals. So you can touch your face or brush your teeth and things like that and your brain believes you are being electrocuted uh, or having a, a hot poke or something poked in your face. So the pain is extremely real for these patients. And it is this issue here deep within the brain, uh, at the brain stem. And I'll just sort of skip forward all of these things, um, just showing this operation. Um, so that's the vessel there on the brain stem. But understanding, you know, what vessel is what, that this is the seventh nerve, this is the fifth nerve, that takes a while, it takes a lot of time studying anatomy. And the last video I showed you was probably less clear what the anatomy was because everything was distorted by this very large brain tumor here. Hopefully it's a lot clearer what the anatomy is. You can see trigeminal nerve, you can see seventh nerve, and you probably start to work out that this is a vein, a very important vein to protect and not take. Uh, and as the, as the operation progresses and as you learn to do more and more of this, you start to learn that these are distal spurious cerebral artery branches. Um, I'm just going to skip forward again um, in the operation. We're now zoomed in on the trigeminal nerve and we're starting to work this superior cerebellar artery off the trigeminal nerve. And this here is the motor root of the trigeminal nerve. But all of these things take time to build this sort of anatomical knowledge. Uh, and it's about going through all of the principles that I talked about so far, this sort of deliberate practice, uh, this focused systematic approach to working through things. That's what builds you to a level where you understand, you know, when you get in there, which is trigeminal, which is seven, eight, it can be 
when people start actually it's very easy to get confused uh, between these things you know which are the tiny perforators that absolutely must be protected what this vein is what this artery is how i work you can see this artery is actually between this is one of my teaching slides uh, this artery is actually between the motor root uh, and the and the sensory root and what, what's this other vessel here you know it's actually another branch of the sca which way is that vessel likely to go how am i going to move around work around this thing it's not easy this thing is completely wrapped around the trigeminal nerve it's got critical perforate is going to the brain stem and unless you really understand your anatomy uh, a lot of it built on some a lot of those pictures and actually doing these operations are less complex operations than i talk about when I teach this operation, I talk about how you alter your viewing angles and things like that uh, uh, to work around um, you know, in very small spaces. Uh, but without understanding that sort of critical anatomy, you have no idea, can you take these vessels? You know, can you not, what vessels can you definitely not take? Where can you work a little bit, a little bit firmer in the dissection where you have to be more careful? You know, what sort of perforators you must protect, which nerve are on, all of those things. Even just getting the craniotomy in the right place. So anatomy is absolutely critical for any bit of surgery, but it cannot be underestimated in its importance for when you're working in neurosurgery, okay? Uh, what it allows you to do is do very nice dissections like this, where you can move the blood vessels away at the end. So you can see the blood vessel of both, both the um, branches of the SA coming off, and very nice view of the trajectory that has been freed off, and we'll place a bit of Teflon just before there. You see the Teflon going in to keep the vessel off. So anatomy, another core, core principle in any bit of neurosurgery, but definitely in these sort of difficult uh, operations. And once you've got the sort of more straightforward things down, uh, you start to realize that actually neurosurgery is extremely challenging. This is a very unforgiving organ. Uh, you are, your mistakes, unfortunately, will be punished harshly. Everybody makes mistakes, but it's about being the best that you can be to try and minimize these mistakes and you won't really learn that unless you are involved in difficult cases and then i showed you a few videos here all of which have gone well uh, i do have videos of cases gone badly but there's nothing like being there and seeing how difficult it is when things are going wrong when it's bleeding what are the important things you know about, about how does the surgeon handle this are they calm and you can't be calm unless you've done a lot of this and you've been there before so i would strongly recommend scrubbing up clocking patients scrubbing up to lots of these operations as many as you can because it's important to see how think when things go well, but it's probably even more important to see when things go badly wrong. How do people react? How would you react? What are you going to do? What can you do to get to a situation that you are going to handle things well when you're in these difficult situations? And that makes a big difference to patients' outcomes. Calm surgeons, skilled surgeons, when things are going badly and things are going wrong, make a big difference to patients. So just to start back where we were at the beginning, everything I've said applies. To all of these cases these are all these are this is an operation that will take two days so is this one or at least a good 16 hours these are both operations that will take 10 to 14 hours to do and to get to this point all of the things we just discussed are key you have to work out from the very beginning how you're going to get to whatever goal you want to get to you need a systematic approach you need to look at this deliberate practice learn your anatomy always bring it back to the patient when you're deciding which way you're going to head with your with your decisions and just remember you just have to make slow progress of course the grand canyon and uh, over hundreds of thousands of years it was carved up really by little drops of water so that can be done we can all do this and then of course when you can't really do something like this unless you have a very very good team uh, and here are everybody from the scrub nurses to the junior doctors on the team to me, my fellow consultant surgeons, uh, everyone from very junior doctors to Mr. Patel, who is one of our most senior surgeons in the country. And we all work together regularly on these cases. I'm sure you've heard this before. Uh, if you want to go far, you've got to go together. And unless you have a strong team, you have absolutely no chance in doing what I've just described here. And I really like to think of this as a team of experts. So if you come back to this operation, it's a chordoma, I said to you, both cavernous sinus are involved, the carotid arteries are involved, the basal arteries are involved, the brain stem is involved. How do you go about tackling a case like this? And, and what you need to do is actually an operation over a few days. We come through the solid petrous bone here where the ENT surgeons will drill that out and come this way. I then work with the endoscopic surgeons, that's remove this bit, and then with the endoscopic surgeons I work 
again at the NT, I want to remove this part here. And if needed, we do it in this case, but if needed, if there's a large defect in the skull base, we then involve the plastic surgeons to plug in a free flap to prevent CSF leaks and meningitis and things like that. And so this endoscopic nose anatomy, you have to have a good understanding of it, but the NT surgeons are much better, and I work a lot with them. Drilling through the solid petrous bone here, the crotch artery and facial nerve. Again, I work with the NT surgeons, uh, and I definitely don't place free flaps unless I have an excellent team of plastic surgeons. And of course, we have ophthalmic surgeons, a whole range of others that we work with regularly. The nurse practitioners are important, the junior doctors are key, everybody's key. And I really like to think of us as a team of experts uh, here at Oxford that allows us to do very complex operations like this well. And that's the next important principle. I think you guys build a strong team around you. And you may think that's le less relevant at your stage, but actually it's not. Uh, even if it's very minor things like working towards exams and things like that, who you surround yourself with really matters. Uh, and you're never going to be strong on your own. I think, you know, think about who, who's around you, who you're going to work with, uh, and where you, how you're going to move forward and build your own team of experts. And find, the final thing really is about evolving. Um, as, as you heard at the beginning, I'm interested in a whole range of projects, uh, including robotic surgery. I'm working with IBM um, and using artificial intelligence for, <coughs> for image analysis. These are 3D models that I build, and then we can, I need to, I need to paste in this picture here, but essentially it's about using augmented reality. And we're looking to start using that, not just for preoperative planning, but uh, we want to start using that interoperatively. We build 3D models all the time. We're moving away from the printed ones now to to augment a reality that we're going to take into our theatres. Uh, and I said to you 15 years ago or 20 years ago, none of this existed. And for you in 10, 20, whatever years time, it'll be completely different. And you must move with the times. Uh, it's very sad seeing very skilled, very good surgeons uh, who are quite stuck in their ways, uh, who I think are not doing the best for their patients because they're not really moving forward and evolving with time. And just as the world around us is changing, surgery definitely is. All of these things I'm sure will be commonplace when you're consultants. Uh, and you must learn, move, and, and, and then develop and build new technology. And so these are the sort of some, what I think at the moment, for me, I understand it's a very biased view. It's not all of the principles of neurosurgery, but for me, it's where I am. Uh, what I'm thinking about now, I'm, I'm very focused on actually trying to train uh, the next generation of complex cranial surgeons. Uh, and for me, I think what, uh, what allows you to become a complex cranial surgeon at the moment is summarized by these principles here. By no means is this uh, an exhaustive list, of course, it's not uh, for principles for neurosurgery. Um, and I'm sure, you know, as I say, I'm, uh, I'm evolving, I'm getting better, uh, I'm using different technology, and my technique is getting better all the time. Uh, I'm sure if you asked me five, ten years from now, I'd have a very different view of what I think the principles of neurosurgery are. But for me, this is where I'm at, uh, and I hope that, you know, it's useful for you for where you are. The final thing I'll say is, um, and I'm sure you're aware of this, but actually um, neurosurgery is an extremely rewarding career. Um, this, is a, this is a young lady with a very, uh, very challenging tumor crushing her brainstem. And when I said to you at the beginning, it's important to take these tumors out and the patient must be well or better. Uh, so I like to put this picture in because I'm a terrible runner. Um, so this is the patient postoperatively with her sister. She raised a lot of money for, her, for our skull-based charity after having this operation over two days to remove this tumor, a small residual, uh, and she ran a half marathon. So she's a much better runner than I am uh, and raised a lot of money for us and very grateful that she's well, uh, that she's giving back uh, to the service. It's a card from another patient. I just put this down because I thought it was a very nice card uh, because she didn't just thank me, but actually the whole team. And, and that's really important actually. It's, it's the whole team uh, that makes a big difference, not one person. Uh, and I think for me, it's been a real privilege uh, to be able to operate in what I think, uh, you know, is the, corners, is the core of what we all are, the human brain. Uh, I think it's, it's a very rewarding career. I've, I've still got a long way to go in my career. I think it will be a very rewarding career for you. Uh, it's about restoring people to back to who they are. And, uh, and I can't think of a better, you know, a better job than that. So thank you very much uh, for, the, uh, for this kind of invitation. Uh, I'll take your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Jairatna. Um, that, uh, that was an excellent talk and thank you for providing us with an overview of um, the principles of neurosurgery. Uh, it seems like a, 
is constantly evolving what this whole notion of the principles are and it sort of develops as you progress in your career. And, I think so. Uh, yeah, and I think you helped us um, consolidate some of the firm ideas that we've got to prioritize patient-centered care, work hard as individuals on our fundamental processes given the high stakes, uh, and also learn to work well as in, in a sort of team framework. Um, and the idea of improving uh, incrementally through that framework of Kaizen that you mentioned, that was something that I, I, I'd like to take away from this. Um, so thank you very much again. Um, and we're all very uh, grateful for the time and uh, effort that you've put in to give this talk. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation. It's very kind. Have a good evening. Okay. Thank, thank you all. Have a good evening. Everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.